My name is Rachel Welburn. I am the Associate Director of the Southern Rural Development Center. So I'm going to be sharing some thoughts with you today. It's not going to be a lecture thing. I'm glad that y'all are all here and I'm glad that we've got a good number that can hopefully join in a dialogue. But I'm going to first hand off to Michael Darty, who will talk a little bit more about the, the vision for these webinars for NACDAP. So Michael? Okay. First of all, welcome everyone. Uh, as Rachel said, I'm Michael Darty. I am sitting here in the and I'm not in the, the dark, it's just my webcam makes it look that way. Um, it doesn't pick, it's, um, and I'm gonna try to stop messing with it because I only make it worse. Um, uh, I am the chair of the Member Services Committee of NACDEP and we are striving to add value to membership. So one of the things that has been suggested and we are starting with this today are to have web, uh, webinars. So this is the first one. We're looking to hopefully have them on a quarterly basis. And we just want to um, see, you know, and this is one of the things that the topics that came up with civil discourse. And we asked, uh, we had some names and we asked Rachel to do it and she graciously accepted. So she is uh, going to go through this session for us. If you've got some other ideas, please don't hesitate to contact me or any of the members of the Member Services Committee of NACDEP to provide that information. And I apologize for my webcam. I think I'm going to just turn it off. Uh, there, that's probably a lot better for everybody. And at this point, I will turn control back over to Rachel's because she has much more meaningful things to say than I do. Well, thank you all for joining. We're so happy to have you here. So we've got a great turnout for this afternoon. And I'm just really pleased to be able to talk a little bit about this topic that's just very near and dear to my heart. You know, as we move through our current culture, finding the, the space to have meaningful conversations is challenging. I think you might all agree, but I want us to really have as much about a dialogue here as a, uh, you know, for me to sit here and lecture to you because it is right after lunch for many of you. And unless you've got your next cup of coffee beside you, I don't want you drifting off. So we'll stay, we'll stay here together. So I'm gonna start us off with a poll. And here are questions we're going to look at. Have you ever participated in a formal debate or and or have you ever participated in an organized dialogue on a difficult issue? So let's see where we are. I'll take a second and vote. Some of you might have done debate teams in high school or college. see where we are. So a lot more of you have participated in dialogues than in formal debate, but there's some of you that have done both. So we've had some experience both ways, which is good, because we're going to be talking a little bit about both. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today is debate versus dialogue, who wins? Extensions roots in this, why dialogue matters, what makes it hard, and how do we make space for dialogues. So just as we get started, I'd love for you to just share with me your thoughts about this. What is debate? How would you define it? You can either drop this into chat or there's not too many of us on. If you'd like to just speak, feel free to just go ahead. Let's get some ideas. How would you define debate? See a few things coming in the chat box. Defending a position, taking a side on an issue and defending. There's usually a winner and a loser. Fact-based articulation of an issue that tries to persuade. Those are good definitions, good characteristics. Two sides arguing for the merits of their position. Informed conversation of the goal of educating, persuading the audience. And you have a set topic and rules. 
you are designated as being for or against an argument put forth. So there's definitely sides and it's about getting the merit of the different positions. There's usually a, a win or loser, right, wrong outcome of this. So those are great pieces, appreciate that. So with that in mind, is debate bad? Okay, I see some no's. Uh, that depends, not usually. Sometimes, a bunch of no's. So we kind of have maybe some shared belief that it can be okay, or it, but in some circumstances it can be a problem. So let's talk about that for a minute. When is debate not helpful? What are your ideas on that? When is debate not helpful? All right, so when the moderation isn't fair, when it's not balanced, when people speak their side but don't actually listen to the other people, when it's not civil or becomes personal in personal attacks, uninformed, when not governed by strong rules, including civil dialogue. There's some other great ideas here. When an issue is nuanced, there are more than two positions and y'all are typing faster than I'm reading, so I know I'm missing some. When, speak, when people speak their side but don't actually listen. When the subject is not cut and dried and there's shades of gray. So we can see that there's times that debate really, really works and could have some good outcomes, but there are also some times when debate can be harmful. So I wanna move a little bit towards talking about the differences between debate and dialogue. And I like this comparison done by Deborah Flick that talks about the differences in the conventional process that you see there on the left is more of the debate model and the understanding process on the right is the dialogue model. So some of these things we've already mentioned on the left, you know, one right answer, there's a, a the goal is to persuade or to win. Usually there's some critical evaluation in there. There's listening for the errors and the flaws so that you can make your, your best rebuttal. So it's, there tends to be, you know, it's a bit of a competition to get the right and the wrong out where the understanding process, more of the dialogue process, values these multiple perspectives. The goal is to understand and to listen more than even being heard. But what can I learn? How can I be curious and open about what's happening here? And then how can I reflect instead of react? So it's really about listening deeply to understand the other person. So if we can just hold these basic ideas in our mind, if we talk a little bit for, further, we'll kind of see how these come together in our work now. I want us to back up just a step though and look at extensions root and know that we didn't invent this. And that's, that's encouraging to me when I got to looking at some of the history and Timothy Schaefer's done some great work on this. If y'all read any of his work, just looking at the roots of extension. I want to share with you just a couple of things. We're not going to go too deeply in this, but there are a couple of the fathers of extension, M.L. Wilson, who has this to say, that free and full discussion is the archstone of democracy. And if you see this picture here, this is a 1930s picture of a dialogue group led by an extension professional. And if you look around the room, I don't know how well y'all can see the picture, it's kind of hard to tell who the leader is. Everyone's sitting together, they're all equal, they're all, uh, nothing. nobody has anything in their lap, nobody's got a PowerPoint up, of course it's 1935, I guess that might be something to do with it. But it's a little hard to tell because they're sitting down and having a conversation. And so in this period of the 30s, there was this time of revival of dialogue and extension. And you can see one of these dialogue books from 1938. This is how to, uh, a group discussion, how to prepare to aid rural groups in organizing and conducting discussion meetings. Cool stuff. 
And then we have this great quote by Kenyon Butterfield, who's another one of the Extension's founding fathers, talking about how this discussion project was one of the most significant developments in Extension work since the Smith-Lever Act was passed. And just recognizing the importance of this kind of work in Extension. So we have great roots here, and it's really encouraging to know that the work that we take on now really stands on the shoulders of a lot of strength. So why does dialogue matter today to extension? We're all familiar with Venn diagrams, and I think as you're doing work in communities, you recognize that there are all kinds of complexities to that work. Being on university campuses, we pretty quickly are you know, can identify the scientific compatibility of any questions. So when we're addressing complex issues, what is the science? What, what do the data tell us? And also, I think it's pretty easy for us to see what is technically feasible. If we're going to solve a problem, it's not likely that we are going to be able to do it with something that we have not figured out how to technically accomplish. So if it, we have, don't have the technology to do something, you know, it's obviously not going to be something that we will put a lot of effort into. Or if we like the finances to accomplish what we want to do, then we may look for a different strategy. And then now there's a good bit of attention on the environment and making sure that when we finish doing whatever we're doing, we still have a world to live in and we haven't destroyed it the process. But equally important to these pieces that we have in our day-to-day -day life, we also need to value and see the importance of what is publicly acceptable for the people that are living in that community, and what is also culturally inclusive and values the different perspectives that are there. So the purpose of dialogue really is to find the sweet spot in the middle. What are the solutions that we can identify by sitting down together and looking at all of the different perspectives to help us resolve a complex issue in our community? And that's where dialogue sits. Another way of thinking about this, and I like this piece from the International Association of Public Participation, it really talks about a range of public engagement. So if you look at this chart, starting on the left, we have the uh, simpler, more direct forms of interaction that we might have with the public, such as just informing them. Maybe there's something that you're, you're working on, you prepare fact sheets, websites, those kinds of things, and you're sharing information, but it's kind of one way. And then as you move over to consult, this is where maybe there's a decision to be made and, and you go into the community and you ask for their opinions on some different options and you get their feedback. Some of you, if you're in county positions, you may have advisory councils where this is how that, that relationship works. You're sharing some ideas and you're getting their feedback. But as you move over farther and farther to the right, we get over to the level of empowering, which is when all the people in the community that are stakeholders on the situation sit down together as equals and together decide not only what to do, but they also take the responsibility of acting on it. And it's over in this space on the far right where we have dialogues, where we sit down together and we talk through the possibilities together and together come up with a solution. I want to point out the sliding scale at the top that is time, power, and complexity. And these three are all important in deciding what is the approach to use in any situation. So let's start with time. Dialogue takes time. If you're going to do dialogue and do it well, it will mean lots and lots of time. And sometimes we just don't have that opportunity. Just this past week, the uh, Octibaha Lake Dam near my house has been under pressure from all the rains and uh, a decision had to be made quickly or the dam was really very much in imminent danger of failing. We don't have time for dialogue on that. Somebody that knows what they're doing, somebody that can go in and make a decision and act just needed to make it happen. And sometimes in communities, it's that way too. There's times that we just don't have time on our hands and a decision has to be made quickly. And then also up here in this sliding scale is power. The more power that 
the stakeholder that the people that are in control are willing to give up and able to give up to community, the more you can move to the right. But there are some times when that's not an option. There may be some people who are, because of their position, they are legally or financially responsible for a decision or resources, and they don't have the ability to give up full power, but they may still can involve. So there's different things that can control there with power in what, what kind of approach we in extension can take in a situation. And lastly, there's complexity. The more complex a situation is, the more it leans towards the right. Because the more that you have these different layers and different perspectives on the situation, the more it takes time to unweave those so that you can find the best solution. So taken together, as we think about our work in extension, we can understand that there are times when we face very complex problems, when power can be shared in the community, and you have time to really seek out the best solution. And that's where dialogue is really a great approach for us to consider. I also wanted to share with you this information. This study was done a few years ago. The Southern Rural Development Center did a multi-state project. It was on dialogues on poverty. And as we did that, we had a research team that followed alongside and came back to the participants in these groups and asked them, if it was all said and done, the dialogues were over, should, is this something that Extension should be doing? Should we be facilitating dialogues? Should we be leading these efforts and helping to coordinate these in the communities? And in all of these communities, 85% of the respondents said absolutely yes. These four quotes here are just flavors of the kind of messages that they gave us whenever we said, why? And you can see some of these key words, extensions are respected, they typically are trained to work with groups, they're well connected, they're perceived as not having a political agenda, they're generally considered to be here to help, they provide valued services, and they're considered credible. So as Extension is viewed by its community, it, it positions us well to help lead dialogue efforts around really tough topics in communities. So then, if we should be doing this and it's great work and all that, what makes it hard? Now I'm gonna do something a little odd for a webinar. I'm gonna be quiet for a minute, but I'm just gonna share a couple of pictures. So if you are looking off somewhere else, you might want to look at your screen for a minute, and I want you just to reflect on these pictures for a minute, and then we're going to stop. And the question I want to ask you is, what do you see in these pictures that reflects something that makes it hard for dialogue? So consider these for a moment. So I'd love to have your thoughts for a minute. What do you think makes it hard for us as community, as extension, to engage in meaningful dialogue? What makes that hard? Distractions. Hmm. Three votes for distractions so far. Wrong, wrong physical room set up. Technology not meeting face-to-face, -face. information's overwhelming, oh yes, willingness, mm -hmm. poor listeners, people talking more than they listen, reporting and evaluation, yeah, we get measured by the numbers we interact with and dialogue is slow, true, topics can be fuzzy, we've become distracted, disconnected, 
value. It's not valued. People don't trust the process. Great comments. Thank you all for sharing those. I really want to just look to back at this one for just a second. When I found this the other day, I was just floored. I mean, I recognize that we spend a lot of time on social media. I spend a lot of time on social media and watching TV, but compared to the amount of time spent socializing, just really surprised me and you know, how that comparison plays out. And I was reading in the same article, and I've got the source down there. I'd be glad for you to share it, to, to look it up further. But talking about how the social media time is growing rapidly. And so as it grows, it's going to take time from something else. And it's just going to be uh, really interesting to watch how that changes our lifestyles. So we have some barriers, we have some challenges. So then the next question is, how do we make space for these connections? And I love these pictures. This looks like my grandmother's front porch from many, many years ago, where you were just had, had that space that invited. And it's not just about a space, because we also mentioned, some of you mentioned this too, that it's partly about trust, it's partly about being open-minded and being ready to listen. So I wanna ask you another question here. What do you need in order to trust someone? What does it take for you to trust someone else and to be willing to talk openly? All right, commonality. Established relationship of sorts. So I might ask you to go a little deeper. What does it take to make that established relationship? Diverse representation, good. A genuine person. What does that look like? How do you know if someone's genuine? Time. Agreement on a goal, common interest. Feeling that there will be some benefit to the dialogue. Validation from someone else I trust, uh, an active listener, yes. Time, I see the word time coming up several times. Shared experiences, people to be able to put their needs, wants, and limits on the table and that they won't judge our opinion, even if it's different. So a lot of what you are sharing here are the kinds of things that really matter in setting up a dialogue where people also can feel comfortable and begin to trust one another enough to open up. In most dialogues, there are ground rules. I like this set, this is just one of many. This comes from the Center for Courage and Renewal founded by Parker J. Palmer. But this is, these are called the Touchstones for Safe and Trustworthy Spaces. So let me just share these with you a little bit. So give and receive welcome. In other words, just inviting people. Everyone has responsibility for inviting others to join and be comfortable. What is offered in the circle is by invitation, not demand. You don't have to speak, but you are invited, encouraged to speak. No fixing, saving, advising, or correcting each other. Ooh, it's not my job to fix you, not your job to fix me. We're here to listen, not to correct and fix the other person and offer advice to them. When the going gets tough, turn to wonder. I love that one. That's uh, something that I've, some language that I've learned is whenever there's something that just doesn't quite make sense to me when I'm listening to someone else to turn that to curiosity. Well, I'm really curious about how you feel about this. Can you share a little bit more? In that curiosity, turn into curiosity instead of turning to tension is a great way to invite that other person to share more so that you can understand more deeply, but it also takes some of the tension out of the conversation. Trusting and learning from the silence. I think as educators, we have a hard time sometimes with silence. So learning to be okay if it's just quiet for a minute. Sometimes people need to think and gather their thoughts, especially when you're talking about a really deep subject. 
Know that it's possible to leave the circle with whatever it was that you needed when you arrived. In other words, you may leave the circle with some unfinished business. You may feel like there's more. You may feel like you need to go somewhere deeper. It's not quite where you want it to be ultimately, but coming to a circle and starting a part of a dialogue is, is good and everyone will leave at a different place, but we all leave with something when we have, have shared together. Being present as fully as possible. We had that picture a few minutes ago of the cute little kids, but with their cell phones and that is us. And being able to just put all of that down is challenging sometimes. Speak your truth in ways that respect other people's truth. Understand that we may not all see the world the same way. So just being respectful in how we talk. Learning to respond to others with open, honest questions. Questions are such great invitations to help someone else open up further. And then paying attention to my own inner teacher or my own inner self. What am I hearing and feeling inside of me? And what does that tell me about myself? And then the last one I think is go, goes to trust, observing deep confidentiality. Just knowing that what you share in a space is gonna stay in that space and that everyone respects that confidentiality. So if you think about these, which one really steps out, stands out to you as something that would help you the most? Or maybe is there something that you feel like is missing that you would add if you were using something like this? Trusting more in the silence, being present, yes. Turning to wonder, it's the different people that are finding their attachment to different ones. I think these are just really kind of cool concepts to just form as a basis for ways to set up that space. It's always, anytime you have a dialogue, having some kind of ground rules, whether it's something like this that you start from or something that's made up completely from, from the group, is just excellent starting points for creating that trusted space. Also, whenever we begin to think about extension, just understanding that there's different roles in dialogue and there's different times that we need to take a different role. So depending on what's going on, we might be comfortable as a small group facilitator, or maybe our strength is in coordinating and getting partners together. Uh, maybe we're good at recruiting people to come. Maybe we're great at taking notes for a group, or maybe we're great at marketing. But I think this, it's important to also notice this word kind of stuck here in the middle, that's the participant, and understanding that there's sometimes in a dialogue that we may need to be the one that sits down as a participant and not trying in any way to be a part of guiding or facilitating the group. And typically that happens when the issue that's being discussed affects me personally. So if we are in my neighborhood, if there's gonna be a dialogue about some new zoning laws, I'm not the one to facilitate that because I own a house over there. I need to sit down and be a participant. There may be other situations that just are very emotional for me, where I just know that I would not be able to stay in a very good neutral space as a facilitator, and that's just recognizing that that's, that may not be the time that I need to be trying to facilitate. So understanding that you can play different roles at different times, and it's going to depend on how you fit within that situation, that community, and what your own personal strengths are. And along that line, whenever we did the work of preparing for coming together for racial understanding, which is our current initiative, before we, we launched that effort and began to develop it, we did a real good assessment of the competencies needed for this work. And here's just a small listing of some of those skills. And there's a link down there for the whole piece if you'd like to read it. It's several pages long to read the, the full version. But this gives us just some ideas of the kinds of skills it takes to be really successful in leading a dialogue. So first of all, really understanding what is a dialogue? How does it work? 
And I think it is important for us as extension people to really understand how it fits within our mission. But sometimes even our peers or our administrators may question that, why, why are you doing this? How is this gonna fit with your day job? So being able to explain that is important. And then being able to understand the background of analysis when you've got a situation, who are the stakeholders, what are the data that you do have around the issue, and then how do you frame it so that it is inviting from all perspectives. And then organizing is about finding the partners and resources and the space for holding a dialogue, making sure that you've brought the right people in that can help reach all of the different corners of the discussion and bring people in that would be really interested and willing to be a part. And there's a process part, just designing and facilitating the process itself. And then you notice this next one, dialogue to action, if used. Not all dialogues end in action, but some of them do. If they do, then being able to help a group get to goals and action steps and developing some leadership around those. And then moving kind of a little more internally, your own cultural competencies, valuing diversity, understanding the biases and stereotypes that might get in the way of a dialogue, being able to regulate your own emotions and support others who also are working through their emotions. And then just as a facilitator, being open-minded, respectful, able to listen, flexible. So it's just a very brief overview, but as I mentioned, you can go to this link at the bottom of the slide and be able to see more there. So I want to kind of end with this quote and then we'll take a few minutes just for some questions and discussion. I love this from Cheryl Richardson, that people start to heal the moment they feel heard. And what I mean by feel heard, and I hope I'm reflecting what Cheryl had in mind, is that's when you really feel like someone completely understood your perspective. They didn't necessarily agree with you, that's okay, it's not required, but they understood. And it wasn't one of those roll their eyes, I got you now or I'm done, are you done? <laughs> but you really felt like you've been heard and just the power of that. And that's really the purpose of dialogue is to help people get to that point where they feel like they've been heard because once we've been heard, then we can move forward in a better place. So just super quickly, I wanted to share with you, I mentioned this briefly coming together for racial understanding. This is our current work that we are leading out of the Southern Rural Development Center. And right, right now we have 26 states that are participating and you got pictures of the two teams, the ones that were trained in 2018 and the ones in 2019. And I know this is a tiny, tiny little screen and you probably don't know all the NACDEP members there are, but if you look through those pictures, you will find a handful of NACDEP members in both pictures. But what is cool to me is that you also will find a handful of people that are family consumer science. And you'll find in both pictures people who are 4-H youth development. And in both pictures you'll find people who are ag and natural resources. And in both pictures you will find administrators, program staff development, and other support mechanisms with extension, along with some partners that are not even extension. One of the things that unites us here across Extension is the value of working in communities in ways that are meaningful. And dialogue is one of the ways that we can really join hands across program areas and do that. So I'm really pleased to be part of this, pleased to have this few minutes to talk to you about it. And now we will just stop for a minute and I'd love to let you just open your mics if you choose and uh, Let's talk for a minute. What are some things that you are doing? What are some things that you struggle with, questions you have that we can share together? And as far as sharing slides, I believe I'm, where's Michael turning, I'm not sure exactly how, I know we are recording this and I am happy to share slides. Is this gonna, is this gonna be up on NACDEP's? Yes, we'll make arrangements to get it posted on the, the NACDEP website. Great, thank you. I see some 
comments about coming together for racial understanding from Lupe, thank you. So far we have had from the 2018 trained teams, they have done some level of training within Extension itself, only Extension so far, the numbers of people who have been part of some kind of training are over 600 now, which is pretty amazing. So I'm excited about that. The 2019 people just went through the training in October of this past year. So they are just now getting organized and we're looking forward to seeing that work grow also. Someone else mentioned navigating differences, which is another fabulous curriculum that really looks at how do we work through our differences in meaningful ways. And I know some of you are probably doing other kinds of efforts also around race, ethnicity, other kinds of diversity, or other tough topics in communities. Hmm. So what are some other, some of you that are doing dialogues now, what are some areas that you have been doing dialogues on? And while you're typing those, I'm gonna look at John's question. Do you have some kind of curriculum ready to offer to the wider community around us external to extension? Um, John, it would depend, I don't know what state you're from. Pennsylvania. Okay, great. So we have, we do have an extension, we have a coming together team that's in Pennsylvania. So that's one connection there is to to connect with those people and I'm glad to share with any of you who those team members are if you don't if you're in one of those states that you saw on the map and you don't know who those team members are I'd love to connect you there's also on our on the website whenever we started this work and we're just beginning to explore the resources we identified a number of pieces of curricula that were available just through extension on any kind kind of dialogue effort particularly looking at the lens of diversity in some way and identify quite a few things. And so those are all posted on a site on eExtension and I will add that to the PowerPoint. So when it gets posted, you'll have that link also. So I'm gonna make myself a quick note of that. All right, so some of the things that you've been working on, water projects, public water, affordable housing, it's a huge issue. Minority Farm Forum in March. Pregnancy and addictions in Kentucky, yes. So there's lots of different ways that dialogues can be used. Youth engagement, yeah, and election citizenship. This is one thing, one area where you really can cross age barriers. You can put teenagers in the room with retirees and have a dialogue that's meaningful around something that they commonly value. So that's really a great opportunity to bring youth into this work. Rural equity and diversity. Yeah, good efforts. So what other questions, comments do you have? I really appreciate all of the dialogue and we will save the chat and I will make sure because I think in the in the recording I don't think the chat shows up so we'll capture the chat and make it available because there's some really great comments and thoughts in here too that I want to make sure that everyone can see later. So I'm curious Rachel uh, this is Michael from Minnesota and I'm curious how do people kind of jump into this are they invited into communities or is it something that uh you know comes from a like you said there's been a couple of regional curriculums but i'm just curious how do people kind of jump in and and all that i would strongly suggest that you go through some kind of training and there are lots of different kind of training modules out there. There's uh, different agencies and organizations that do training. We're working with Everyday Democracy on coming together for racial understanding. That's one of the really great organizations out there that, that does training in communities and they do a lot with extension. Some of the others of you may know of other organizations. I know Kellogg is doing quite a bit on uh, racial dialogues in particular. 
So I would really encourage you to find training. Um, I think I got really got my feet wet with Everyday Democracy, so they're, they're kind of my, my go-to. They've got a, a great website with lots of great materials on them. And then I think, you know, if there's opportunities through NACDAP if we have a critical mass of people that really want to learn more and want to grow the skills, I think that's a good opportunity for us to consider doing something as an organization. Anytime you have an opportunity to get to strengthen your facilitation skills, to strengthen your listening skills, your organizing skills, take advantage of those. Those are very good skills that you're going to be able to apply all, of, all across your work. Does anyone else have organizations or training that they have used to help strengthen their skills? Because I, I know from some of the other names I see on here that some of you are very experienced also. John asked a really great question about incorporating these concepts into social media. I have not done this but I have seen some really interesting kind of pilot projects where dialogues were, were held on like a closed Facebook page, which is interesting. And then there's the Text Talk Act project that was, that's done. I'm trying to think who led that one. You can Google it probably, Text Talk Act, three words. That uh, is a, an initiative to kind of get your friends together on social media and just decide that you're going to have a dialogue that way. So there's some things being tried out there. I have not tried them, but I'd be curious to know if anybody else has tried something that's worked well or see something. Uh, Linda mentions Kettering Foundation. Yes, uh, we've worked with Kettering some. eXtension has got some training opportunities. Michael mentions that the member services committee is looking for ways to increase the value of membership. So these topics might be something that we could look at. Let's see, lots of things in here. Make sure I'm not missing something. If I'm missing your comment or question, feel free to just open your mic and speak. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, John, it'd be great to have a best practices on social media for moderating, something like that. I agree, that would be an interesting tool. Yeah, Anne mentions needing the needing an objective facilitator, moderator, especially when an issue is contentious. And so sometimes you can use an outside agency or organization. But something else that I have seen done effectively with an extension is just to cross state lines or cross county lines to help each other. So if I'm in a county next to you and your county's dealing with something that's very contentious, I might can come over and facilitate in your county. And then down the road, six months from now, when my county's struggling with something, you may be able to come over and facilitate in my county. Or as I mentioned, sometimes crossing state lines. So it's another way that we as extension can support each other by crossing over and became, being able to truly be that neutral facilitator when the local, the people living in that community really can't be in that space. Uh, yeah, Michigan State University's facilitative leadership training is excellent. It is a kind of, I would say, an all purpose kind of facilitating, a little, little different from just dialogues, but there are some principles and practices there that can be used in dialogues also. It's an excellent course. I definitely recommend that. And I see Lupe has mentioned needing to help a group with data analysis, which is a really great opportunity for extension also. Sometimes part of the issue is, you know, what, what do we know, what do we not know? And sometimes data analysis can help as a part of that. I 
Well, I appreciate all of the, the comments, responses, and, and you helping me out by giving some input on the questions. Um, I believe we've had a great time together. I've enjoyed getting a little better acquainted with some of you and also seeing again some familiar faces. So I think as we move forward in NACDAP, as we move forward in our communities, just being aware that there is this thing called dialogue and there may be a way by working together, we can really bring communities to a space where getting solutions, coming to solutions that are meaningful and that are really valued by all the participants is, is, is really worth it. Uh, it's an investment of time, it's an investment of our effort, but the end goal is really gonna mean that we come to a better project or a better solution than we might if we don't take the time for dialogue. So appreciate all of you, appreciate your participation today. I do have here at the very end, which I have dropped, but I will put into the chat box. I'll be glad to share my email and welcome you to email me if you have a question, or if there's something that I can help you with. I don't have all the answers by any means, but if I can, if I don't know the answer, I will do my best to help you find someone that can help you further. I can't type and talk at the same time. I don't know if anybody else has that problem. <laughs> all right, there's my email. Thank you all again. I appreciate it. Uh, I will look forward to hearing from you. And uh, we'll, Michael, thank you so much for your leadership in NACDAP and starting this series. I look forward to seeing what other topics are going to be discussed. And I'll look forward to the opportunity of sharing this information with you also. And we'll take NACDAP further. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rachel.